Jackson. Swing. This is going to be a home run. Unbelievable. I don't believe what I just saw. Wherever he went, he won. In just four years, he led three teams to championships at three different levels, high school, college, and the pros. And along the way, he charmed us all, flashing a smile bright enough to light the city of Los Angeles. Magic Johnson turned a laid-back, show-me culture into a college crowd that lived and died with each Laker game. It was a love affair. They called it Showtime. Magic played 12 full seasons in the NBA, leading the Lakers to five titles and nine appearances in the finals. As a 6'9 guard, he revolutionized the position and resurrected the triple-double. Then, one day in 1991, he stepped to the line and announced it was all over. Because of the, the HIV virus that I have, attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers uh, today. When you talk about letting the air out of a balloon, having a crash landing, and there's no words to define what that meant to this franchise, what that meant to those of us that were so close to him. We do not, you know, want to eulogize him. You know, we want to now give him, you know, all the love and support and prayers and all the other people that are afflicted by this insidious disease. AIDS was synonymous with death. And I think that's immediately what everybody feared, is that Magic was going to die. Everyone was afraid for him personally. I just didn't want to see this bubbly, enthusiastic guy suddenly not be that way anymore. And that was my greatest concern for him. It wasn't the basketball part of it. At the time that Magic Johnson announced that he was HIV positive, the prevailing medical intelligence was that by this time, Magic Johnson would either be a pathetic, dying man barely recognizable physically, or he'd already be dead. It was just like knowing someone that's got cancer, that's cancer that's run throughout their entire body. You, you know they're going to die. It's just a matter of time. I asked the Lord to please let my son live. Don't take his life. As shockwaves from Magic's disclosure radiated well beyond the sports world, he was left with an even more painful task, the emotional disengagement from the Laker Brotherhood and the game that had always sustained him. The hardest thing for Irvin that day was not speaking to the press and telling the world. It was going downstairs to the locker room and telling his fellow teammates that he's not going to be there anymore for them. He's not going to be on the court. That was the only time I saw Irvin Johnson break down. Magic called the night before and told me that he had something then very important he wanted to say to me and to meet him at the forum, and that's when he told me. And all I could do is cry. This isn't how the movie's supposed to end. You know, the good guys are always supposed to ride off in the sunset. The day that we found out, it just seemed like the end of the world. We cried and we thought that it was over. Even with this devastation, he just said, you know what, we're going to fight this thing. And I was, I was like, okay, let's do it. He tried to be as positive as he could, and he smiled, which is his usual response to everything. He said, I'm going to do it the way I've always done it which is exactly the way he handled it today, directly, honestly, and in an extraordinarily upbeat fashion, which is just magic. My father taught me strength, and I, that's what I am. I'm too strong, I don't worry about it, I just keep going. It was this unshakable optimism that carried a new and penetrating message about AIDS to a nation in denial. To have a man like Magic Johnson come out and say, yeah, I'm, I'm HIV positive and, and watch me continue with my life. 
lets a lot of people realize that this is not the end of life. If the end was unclear, Magic's story started with a little boy, a basketball, and a dream. of his social disease, he was born in Lansing, Michigan, to Christine and Urban Johnson in 1959, one of ten children. When he was about six, he used to roll up socks and go around the house and, and pretend it was a basketball. He would use the uh, clothes basket and he would shoot these socks. Playing one-on-one -on -one with the socks, he would be Will Chamberlain, I would be Walt Frazier. So I just had to do what I had to do, take him to school, yeah. <laughs> the youngest of four boys, Irvin rarely felt the luxurious touch of new clothes. My brother's pants went down to me and, and, and so on. As you look back, it kind of hurt it because you didn't, you couldn't dress the way the other kids dressed. But like I said, as a, as a big family, you learn how to, to appreciate what you have. What Irvin appreciated most was not a hand-me-down, but a brand new object. It was round, and one day would fit in his hand like a king's scepter. His dad bought him his first basketball. That was the highlight of his life. If you could see the smile on his face, you would thought it was Christmas. It didn't matter when it, what time of the day it was, uh, he could be going to school to catch the bus. He would dribble basketball. The neighbors would have to tell him, Irvin, cut it out. Early in the morning, you hear a ball dribbling, going down the street, and uh, the neighbors used to get so mad at him. He drilled it to the store uh, downtown, back uh, just around the block. That shows the inches right there. That, hey, this is what he's going to do. He not only wanted to play the game, but he wanted to change the game. His legend grew from playing on the playgrounds, because everybody would see this kid and come out. Man, he can play, and then they tell somebody else, and then it just got all over town, and they start looking for him and asking for him, let's play, let's play. In 1974, Irvin took his playground game to Everett High School. I could see the greatness of Irvin Johnson when he was about 14 years old coming into high school. Once we got in a game, he would always include everybody. He wanted to win. That meant if he had to score 50, he would, but if he had to score 20, and get everybody else involved. That's the greatness I, that I appreciated about Irvin. I just love playing, getting out there, and uh, you know, hope my team win. If I'm playing pickup ball, whenever, I just want to win. In his first season, Johnson pulled the Everett Vikings out of the doldrums of losing basketball as they became state championship contenders for the first time. In the process, he became the darling of the press. A guy came in and said, uh, I got to give you a nickname. I've never seen anything like this. And I said, uh, I'm 15. And I started giggling. All my boys, they giggling too. Like, yeah, okay, yeah, you're going to give my nickname. <laughs> so he says, somebody's called Dr. J. Somebody has the name Big E. He said, can I call you Magic? I like, yeah, right. So the next day in the paper back home, Irvin Magic Johnson, Dubbed Magic, his fame spread through Michigan. Even if you didn't go to Everett, you knew who he was. All the girls would say, well, you know, can you tell your brother to call him? I'm like, no, I can't tell my brother to call you. You know, there were just things like that, you know, or you can't even get me some tickets, you know. No, I can barely get my own tickets. He had this huge afro, and it had to, his afro had to be in place. He used to ask one of us, because we had so many girls, if we could braid his hair. It had to be picked out and blown out, and it had to be shaped. It had to be looking good. You know, he, um, he didn't play with his fro, and so we took good care of him. In his senior year, Magic averaged 29 points and led Everett to where it had never gone. For this team, Everett High School, who really didn't have a history of basketball, to win the state title, you know, it was just like, who's Everett? And all of a sudden, here they are, and they couldn't be stopped. 
Recruited by over 100 schools nationwide, the hometown hero stayed put and attended Michigan State. He wanted to be a guard from day one, even though he was 6'8". This first game, he scored seven points and had seven turnovers, and there were people that said, well, Judd is ruining Magic Johnson, playing him out of position. But Magic quickly adjusted to his new position, and by mid-season, the Spartans stood in the glare of the national spotlight. That's what I remember about Michigan State, the fact that we got a chance to change college basketball in a sense, and we did it with style and play. He had an unbelievable basketball IQ. He was the, the leader. He was a take-charge guy from the day he walked on the court. As Michigan State's resident basketball genius, Magic had clearly found a new home. He also found Cookie, his future wife. We totally fell in love at first sight. I had a boyfriend at the time, and when I decided to go to Michigan State, he's, no, you can't go to Michigan State. And I'm like, why can't I go to Michigan State? You know, he's like, you're going to meet Magic. You're going to meet Magic and Mary. And I, that, I'm, that's the truth. That's, that's a true story. And I, at the time, I, I had no clue who he was. He had the whole world at his feet at 18. He became two different people. When he was with me, he was Irvin. But the minute we stepped outside that door, he became magic. And I, and I didn't like magic that much. But Johnson's magic side prevailed in 1979 as the Spartans improved each game. Soon they would face the ultimate test, the run for the national championship. At the end of the 1970s, college basketball was still in recovery from several crippling point-shaving scandals dating back to the 50s. College basketball was not a national sport, and the networks didn't cover the final four or the final game uh, the way they would later. There was not the hype, there was not the media attention, there was not the newspaper attention. Aided by forward Greg Kelser, Magic led the Spartans into the final four. If the nation took interest, the Michigan State student body was a quiver with joy. Michigan State hadn't had a winning team like that in a long time. And, you know, to make it to the Final Four, you know, it was, it was great. And it was very exciting. Um, I mean, it was, the tension on campus, it was just like, you know, uh, about to boil over. Meanwhile, across the southern state line, Larry Bird's Sycamores of Indiana State savored their unbeaten season. We were totally shocked. I mean, we'd watched them all year long coming along, and we kind of thought, you know, well, as soon as they get to the tournament, then we'll find out the real thing. And then somehow they just kept winning. Michigan State wasn't a drop kick then either. I mean, back then it was believed that Magic was great, but oh, he couldn't shoot. And so it, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that we'd see Magic and, and Larry in the final. And then the unlikely occurred. Magic and Bird would meet for the national title. Their differences were striking. When Larry Bird played against Magic Johnson uh, in the 1979 NCAA Finals, you would have thought that there couldn't be two people less alike in the world. I did not like Larry Bird, he didn't like me, because we were both going after the same thing. I wanted to be the best and he wanted to be the best. So it's like two old gunslingers saying, meet me out front. And you know, only one could survive. All of a sudden, you had a, a college basketball game that felt like a heavyweight championship fight. This thing picked up momentum, it picked up momentum, and, and here you had this jazzy kid from East Lansing and, and, and the hick from French Lake, and, and one kid with a team of four players that you knew wouldn't be able to get a pickup game as soon as the tournament was over. And then this, this team that, that had to be flashy because they had to keep up with Magic. It was Ali Frazier. It's, it's, it's all it was. As it turned out, they, they were Ebony and Ivory twins. They were, they were the same guy. They were small town guys who grew up on the, their local hard courts where they could spend five hours, seven hours a day just playing basketball. And the only thing they cared about was winning the game. I seen Michigan State play the Russians on cable TV. A lot of my teammates were over, uh, over uh, my apartment watching the game. And after we watched, I don't know, more than half the game. I said, Michigan State's the best team in the country. They're going to win it all this year. Bird's idle prediction proved all too real. Magic flew over the Sycamore, scoring 24 points, while a beleaguered Bird remained on the ground. Magic had a tremendous advantage of 
guards of that era and even guards of today is that he could see the whole court. He could see over people because of his height and then his great ability to handle the ball and pass. Uh, he could just do more things because he was a 6'8 point guard. Magic was just mind-boggling to me, the way he could get the ball off the board and dribble it up and make the play. And it seemed like he had his hand in everything. It's all over. Michigan State University, National Champions, 1979. That was a seminal game. It brought a lot of non-college fans to the game who then became college basketball fans. I got a chance to turn Michigan State around and make them a basketball power. We ended up winning the national championship. After the NCAA, somebody else would have just been happy with winning that and just gloated on that. And it only took him that long to say, oh, OK, I'm, I'm moving on to the next step, and I'm going to take this other place to the next level. With the stage set for a new era, two players would dominate national attention for the next decade. The Magic Bird college game changed the NBA and colleges. It made the Final Four so popular, and then it totally turned around the NBA because that's where the show was going next, and it was Magic leading the way. It was big then because it was the highest rated college basketball game of all time. If you wrote this, if you scripted it, and then tried to make it a movie, people would say, hey, it's too cliche. But in real life, we really embraced it and loved it. The league needed that. The NBA at the time, struggling, doesn't begin to describe where the NBA was. We hoped the glow that attached to their uh, season would attach to us. The rumors say that you played your last college game and that you're heading away from Michigan State. The rumors were fact. Magic took his show to a land where dreams are only outnumbered by tragedy. Torn by nearly a decade of violence, drugs, and shoddy play, the NBA looked desperately for someone to lead it out of the wilderness. Help came out of the East, bearing gifts. The Los Angeles Lakers select Irvin Magic Johnson, Michigan State, 6'8", 200 pounds. The Lakers needed a player that was a leader. They needed a rebounder. And they got him one player. He was a breath of fresh air <laughs> for the team and for the league. On the eve of his very first day, I would not impose upon any rookie in all of professional sports to talk to you. But I want you to know that this man has a smile that lights up a television screen from here to Bangor, Maine. The Lakers are dead in the water. They're not going anywhere. He's, it's just not happening. This kid shows up. We all remember that first game. Ford sends it to Kareem. Sky hook up and good. Lakers win. Score it. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has given the Los Angeles Lakers a victory. Magic ran exuberant. Threw both arms and both legs around Kareem and started hugging. And Kareem had never seen anything like that before. I'm choking. Great shot. Only one, you know. He was holding him and hugging him. And Kareem said, hey, we haven't even got started yet. We got a long season to go. He's confronted with this kid jumping up into his arms, celebrating this victory. And, and the look on his face said, we know what he said to him later. He said, young fella, don't ever do that again. Because we got 81 more games. I look back up at him and I said, if you hit a shot like that 81 more times, you're going to be getting 81 more hugs. <laughs> and I think when he saw this kid out there, and he was a kid, uh, with this enormous amount of energy, I think it rejuvenated his interest in the game. It was a wonderful combination because Abdul Jabbar probably needed the burden relieved from him out there every night having to do it by himself. He came at the perfect time for my career because I had lost a lot of enthusiasm. His skill and expertise is what the team was lacking. We improved uh, so much and it made it easy for me to smile. There was something magnetic about this guy. Not only his play, but that smile, the personality. He did everything right. You had to follow him. Magic took the once dispirited Lakers into the 1980 Finals versus the 76ers. 
spot when an injury knocked Kareem Abdul-Jabbar out of Game 5, it appeared the Lakers' 3-2 advantage was over. I think the Sixers felt the game was like practice. Obviously, they were going to win. I mean, you can't come to Philadelphia and win without Kareem. So you could play magic at center. You can, you can do anything you want. We just wanted to go out and compete. Winning was the last thing on our mind. So when we come out to the center court, Magic steps into the center, and I think it shocked Philadelphia. Magic played brilliantly, dealing seven assists, grabbing 15 rebounds, and scoring a season-high 42 points. The Lakers won their first NBA title in eight years. And the most valuable player is Magic Johnson. He starts at center, plays forward and guard, and leads the Los Angeles Lakers to the World Championship 123-107. His performance that game might have been one of the greatest of all time. 42 points, he shot the hook shot, the jump shot, he drove to the basket, he blocked a couple shots. I mean, he did it all. I've never liked Magic Johnson at all, by the way. <laughs> He's a guy that should have stayed in college and got in his college degree. At least stay for one more year till his junior year. We would have gotten another one. I love to win, and uh, I guess that's the thing. I go in thinking we can win any game that I play. Uh, Despite, you know, Kareem wasn't in, and we want to say, hey, we did it for you, big fella, because you got us here, and uh, don't, we don't, we don't want to take nothing away from him. A lot of people you know, really weren't sure whether or not you were going to be making him this league and making it big. And you certainly made a believer out of me, because yeah. I haven't seen you play that much. You were absolutely fantastic. I believe Kareem not playing was the worst thing that could have happened to the 76ers in that series. 20 years old and won a state championship in high school, an NCAA championship, and now a world championship. Very little left to conquer. <laughs>
Magic Johnson was different, and it was evident and clear when he had the ball that things were going on that people hadn't seen. He can do anything on a basketball court. He could be a power forward. He could be the world's tallest point guard. He could be the world's shortest seven-foot center. If you go to the worst seat in the arena, there's only a few that reach that high. You know, Magic Johnson reaches all the way to that top row. But if anyone could dim Showtime's dazzle, it was Larry Bird and company. Three times in four years, the NBA's two leading lights met in the finals, and the heat generated by their rivalry was felt across the nation. The Lakers and the Celtics really didn't like each other, and it kept fans attracted to it. It kept fans enthralled. And the fact that, that every time they were asked to perform, Magic and Bird really did only heightened it. It was the East Coast versus the West Coast. Celtic pride versus Laker tradition. It was Bird versus Magic. The most hellacious competitors going at each other. They'll kill each other out on the court. Whatever it takes to win. Magic always needed that. We needed each other. We made each other get better and better. We made each other have to go practice in the summertime because I knew Larry Bird was shooting two, three hundred jumpers a day. So that made me have to do it. I heard Converse made a pair of Bird shoes for last year's MVP. Yep. When they made a pair of Magic shoes for this year's MVP. Okay, Magic, show me what you got. It was great. I mean, everywhere you went, it was either, you know, Celtics lovers, Celtics haters, Laker lovers, Laker haters. And uh, it was very unique, especially being on one coast and the other. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of players don't want to admit this, but we used to look in the papers to see what the Lakers were doing. In 1984, the Celtics claimed first championship blood from the Lakers in the war between Magic and Bird. While the Boston Stars' 27-point average lifted his team to a seven-game victory, Johnson made ill-advised decisions in the closing minutes of the fourth quarter in overtime losses in games two and four. Every year, that was the thought. We're going to get Boston this year, and I think it became even more so in 84. Uh, we had them on the ropes, and it turned out to our dismay. And I always remember sitting in Boston Garden in the shower of magic, and we were like, man, we had that, but you know what? The fun thing about this rivalry and this game is that there's always next year. In 1985, L.A. beat Boston in six games. The interior private war between Magic and Bird shed no light on who was better. Johnson recorded a pair of triple doubles and dished out a finals record 84 assists, while Bird averaged 24 points. It wasn't easy stopping Showtime, you know. <laughs> when they got running, there wasn't a whole lot you could do. When they got out and got in their groove, it was just a just racehorse basketball at its best. And Magic was just um, a great guy in the middle of the break, making great decisions, keeping pressure on your defense all the time. With their head-to-head -head championship series tied at one series apiece, Magic and Bird played the rubber match in 1987. The Lakers trailed by one in the closing seconds of game four, when Johnson took matters into his own hands. I'm dribbling, dribbling, now the clock is going down, down. And so I just faked like I was going to go baseline, went to the middle. Mikhail and Paris jumped out at me. So I was like, the only shot I could shoot was a hook shot. So I let it go. Left goes Magic. He's got it. Five seconds left. Magic down the middle, just what I thought. A hook shot at 12. Yeah! Two seconds left. The Lakers take the lead. Magic's just a great basketball player. He's the best I've ever seen, you know. I. Unbelievable. I don't know what to say. If he doesn't make that shot, the series is tied 2-2. If the Celtics win at home in game five, they take a 3-2 lead back to L.A. and they just need to get one of the remaining two games. And they might, they might well have done it. That's the biggest basket of Magic Johnson's career. The Lakers went on to win the title in six games. They repeated the next year, and in 1989 closed out the 80s, losing to Detroit in the finals. By 1991, Magic had eclipsed Oscar Robertson's all-time assist record and had joined Bird as a three-time MVP. Thanks to Johnson and his East Coast antagonist, the NBA was never... 
from ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We begin tonight with the fate of a single individual. The basketball star Magic Johnson confirmed a short while ago that he has the AIDS virus and he will retire from the Los Angeles Lakers. It was almost like hearing he had been in a car crash and had been killed in a car crash. It was that kind of a shock. Magic's going to die. When it became clear that Johnson's life was not immediately at risk, the public focus shifted from the candor of his announcement to the cause of his condition. Magic's image did not bear up under this new light. Magic Johnson was not a hero. He admitted his lifestyle, and anybody with that kind of lifestyle really isn't a hero. Here we were glorifying him when he was coming out saying at that time that he had HIV and that he had been very unfaithful and had put himself, his own interests, over his family's. I lost some respect for him for that. Ah, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad things. You know, there's like, you know, the parties and the, and the you know, the girls and, you know, whatever, all that. Most of that time, I wasn't here and that's why I wasn't here. His partying had always been legendary, frankly. Imagine he was such a good guy, such a nice guy. He was almost like a Babe Ruth, and a lot of things that happened off the court just weren't written about. There was a room at the Forum, sort of a side room that belonged, it was like a sauna room. And that room kind of belonged to Jamal after games. And, you know, he would have, I guess he'd have women come in after the games and unwind that way. But when Jamal retired, that room got bequeathed to Magic. And so Magic would have his guys, from what I understand, would have his guys kind of shoot, find a woman in the audience who kind of suited him or, or he had some woman who was coming to the game and they would meet him in this room after the game and Magic, he would always be the last guy in the locker room. Always have a smile on his face. There's an infidelity in pro sports. There's, a, I think, an acceptance that is really disturbing. Because these guys are so-called superheroes, they're supposed to be superheroes sexually too. What? his situation did was it opened the eyes to everybody else in the league and I think everybody who's living that type of lifestyle. Johnson struggled to explain away his infidelities on national television. Sex in an elevator? You know, different women have different fantasies and you wanted to make sure they reached their fantasies. I was, that was my thing. But I mean, you were Magic Johnson. Like I said, women have different fantasies. Some want to be with two or three at a time. You know, one time I had six at one time. That's just... Six women? Six women. Now, was that their fantasy or your fantasy? That was both. <laughs> Probably most, mostly mine. His sort of intimation that somehow he had been victimized by a woman or women. Uh, he basically said, hey guys, I'm telling you, you know, keep it in your pants because otherwise this is what happens. Well, that's not, you know, that's simply not true and it, it, it conveyed a guilt onto some unseen woman and I felt that that was unfair. But civilian clothes didn't quite suit magic. His game hadn't changed. His physical strength was uncompromised and his will to win remained firm. Three months after announcing he was HIV positive, he took the floor at the 1992 All-Star Game. But it wouldn't be a smooth return. There were players like Carl like Malone, like Mark Price, who weren't sure that it was safe for Magic to play. They didn't know what the, what the risks were for playing with somebody who had the HIV virus. But I think Magic Johnson overpowered that tension with his great joy, and you could see it in his face, getting out there and playing. In typical Magic fashion, he would own the day, scoring 25 points and winning the MVP. Three pointers! Seeing everybody embrace magic at the end of the day, I think that did a lot for people's understanding and awareness of HIV. He comforted other people and said, don't worry about me, I'm going to be fine, I'm going to deal with this. And he was, he was still Irvin Johnson, he was not, you know, broken by this. The reaction to magic at the All-Star Game and a gold medal performance in the Olympics that summer convinced Johnson to rejoin the Lakers the following preseason. When he wanted to come back, there were people talking about whether they could play against him. There was a great debate. If I get in collision with a guy, it don't have to be magic. It could be Joe Smoke. But the fact of the matter is, if you got the AIDS virus, it'll be hard for me to play as hard as I'm capable of playing. And if people can't respect my decision, that's tough. 
Magic's return ended before the regular season began. Magic Johnson has retired from basketball again. This time he says he will not change his mind. Johnson's decision to retire again appears to have been influenced very much by what has happened in the intervening months. In 1994, Johnson grew restless from the game of basketball and accepted an offer to coach the Lakers. Magic uh, went into coaching because uh, he always felt that I, I think, even as a player, that I can change it. He could always control it as a player. I can change it. I can make us win. I can make this play work. I can make him a better player. Don't worry. I can handle it because he was in control of it. I was going to dictate it. I'll take care of it. And then when he became a coach and he put that responsibility in the hands of immature, not as talented players, it probably was very frustrating for him. With a record of 5-11, and 11, Magic stepped down after just 16 games. But the thought that he might be done with basketball was unacceptable to him, prompting a comeback as a player in 1996. 32 games later, however, he knew that the curtain had rung down on Showtime. It took away a little bit from what he had accomplished. It wasn't just a matter of coming back once and having it not work out. It was coming back, retiring, coming back, retiring, coming back, retiring. Even if he wasn't doing it, he was talking about it. I don't think there's any question that, that had he not done the seesaw thing, that he would be held in high regard. Once he quit, he should have stayed quit, because to come back even after he did was such a distraction, and he should just be magic and be an ambassador, but he couldn't, and then he started his TV show, and that was a nightmare. Even when he engages in something that is an abysmal failure, like his late night television program, which only lasted a couple of months, he seems to be having fun doing it. Not very good at it, uh, you know, that's, that's why I don't play basketball and he shouldn't try to do late night shows. As Magic's public persona grew increasingly strained, he took his attention elsewhere, soon becoming the most potent voice in the HIV community. He is a hero in the subsequent life following his disclosure of HIV infection in putting his effort, his money, into the cause. I mourned the loss to the game. And then I thought um, that when he went out and talked about it and told people don't do what I did, that he was reminding us of something that was very deep. And that is that in all of us, our self-destructive impulses live right alongside those things we're most proud of. I wanted to help other people. I knew that there was a lot of people living like I was living, so maybe hopefully I could save some people's lives. They needed a spokesperson. They needed somebody to really fight and stand up and talk about it and work hard for the whole HIV and AIDS community. I've done that, and I will continue to do that. Johnson continues an active and productive life thanks to breakthroughs in AIDS research. When Irvin was diagnosed, we only had a couple medications to use against HIV, and those were not powerful drugs. So at most, we were prolonging lives by a matter of months, not years. This virus, with minor exceptions, has been totally controlled, and that his immune system is many times better than back in 1991, and consequently, you see a very healthy man. In September of 2002, Johnson was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame after a unanimous vote. Sharing the day was the player against whom he was measured from college days forward. Together, they invested the ceremony with a special light. I was going to write up a big speech, but I wanted to talk from my heart. But I said, damn, he broke my heart so many times, do I have anything left? But I've always said that if you put Michael Jordan's name in a hat, Magic Johnson's name in a hat, and you picked out one of them, you wouldn't be disappointed at all. I have to thank God because 11 years ago, I didn't know if I would be here to accept this award. Larry, the biggest reason that I'm here is because of you making me go to that gym every summer, not only staying for four hours, but I figured I'd better stay for six, because I knew you were there about five or six yourself. 
the thing that characterized his game was a Greek word called enthusiasmos, the gift of giving the best with enthusiasm. That's what he did every game. I thank him for spreading the court out and, and making you go, did you see that? I thank him for making team bigger than I. It's not like that now. He taught me how to run my VCR because you never wanted to miss a magic game, you know? Changing venues from passing lanes to Wall Street, Magic had turned himself into a new kind of role model. His real estate company developed property in minority neighborhoods, and his movie theaters rank among the most profitable in the country. I'm so used to winning, I don't know nothing else. And I knew nothing else back then. He hates to lose. <laughs> he hates to lose at anything. They may be better players, but they'll never be better winners. And that's what my whole goal was, was to win. Of all the nicknames, probably as good as it is Magic Johnson. Magic is exactly what he was. All we can hope for as we go through that new millennium is that there'll be a Magic Johnson there for us. He works out at dawn, drinks a cocktail of three drugs twice a day, and tells us the AIDS virus is all but gone from his blood. As if to prove it, he plays in quality pickup games with the same fire he displayed at the forum. Irvin Johnson will never get basketball out of his blood. For ESPN Classic Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler. Throughout their history, the Lakers have had a long line of dominating big men. George Mikan, Wilt Chamberlain, and Shaquille O'Neal overpowered opponents with size and strength. But Kareem Abdul-Jabbar ruled the middle in a different way, using agility and finesse. Kareem was a true giant of the game, and he's featured this week on Vintage NBA. Day and aging Kareem found his fountain of youth in the 1985 NBA Finals. We'll be right back. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's stature, one simple retirement ceremony wouldn't do him justice. So during his final season, Kareem was honored in every NBA arena. His Laker teammates presented him with a rocking chair, and fans around the league had a chance to say goodbye to the master of the skyhook. The shot was his signature, and he used it to write his own indelible chapter in NBA history. That's it for this edition of Vintage NBA. So glad you could be with us. I'm Robin Roberts, and we'll look for you again next time. Take care. It may be the last time we shake hands. It may be the last time we make plans. But whatever happens, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Mm -hmm.